Good evening and welcome to our Christmas Eve service. I'm so glad you're here and I hope you find comfort, joy, hope and love during our time together. We stop and rest this time of year right after we run around like crazy doing all the things that need to be done. My name is the Reverend Rosemary Morrison, and it is my honor to serve the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. So let's just take a moment now to settle in. Take a few deep breaths. <sighs> Arrive as however it works for you. If you like, you could have a candle nearby to light during the chalice lighting song. As Unitarian Universalists, we light chalices at the beginning of our services and sometimes at our meetings. So as the symbol of our faith, feel free to have a chalice ready at the waiting for you. We, as Unitarian Universalists, are not bound together by a common set of beliefs, but by our promise to support one another in our individual searches for truth and meaning and we are guided by our principles, and we draw from many sources. Whatever you believe or don't believe, whomever you love, however you understand family, whatever your age, race, or ability, you are welcome here. We begin our gathering this evening by acknowledging that we are located on Treaty 6 territory. We respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Nations peoples, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. We will not be stopping during the service for an offering, however, I would like to remind you that for the month of December, we are sharing our abundance with RISE, Reconciliation in Solidarity Edmonton, a not-for-profit society. Founded in 2015 in response to the one-year anniversary of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's national event in Edmonton. RISE is made up of people from all walks of life committed to moving reconciliation forward in our community. Please take time this holiday season to give generously to this important organization. This Christmas Eve service has been crafted to explore the beauty, the mystery, the Christmas story of a birth under a star, along with a retelling of that story in a humorous light. To open our service, we will enjoy a beautiful rendition of O Holy Night. Jess Hutman is a Unitarian Universal Universalist and professional musician. She has graciously and um, so skillfully recorded many songs and carols along, and she has done this along with other musicians in some cases. And, these are free for free use in our Unitarian Universalist services. All music this evening has either been purchased, is being used with permission, or is for royalty-free use. I am profoundly grateful for the talent and generosity of these musicians and authors. And now, O oh Holy Night, to begin our Christmas Eve service.
Merry Christmas, Greg. Love you. If you have a chalice with you or a candle, and I invite you to light it during this song by Chris T. Stewart and sung by Sharon McKnight. If you came to the Blue Christmas service, you will have already heard this piece. I hope you love it as much as I do. If not, sorry, <laughs> you're going to hear it again. Um, this piece is called Light One Candle. And if you don't have a chalice or a candle with you, that's okay. Light this, your candle in your imagination. Um, that is perfectly great too. Light one candle. When darkness holds you and you can't find a way and hopelessness seems to surround you take this candle it will shine anywhere the burning flame it will remind you a single candle lights the way through the light share a poem by the Reverend Teresa Ninian Soto. She says, I, I try to write a poem every year. I don't remember why, but I like doing it. Here is the one that they've written for 2021. It doesn't seem like much. One emperor, one mandate, one census, two young people traveling, and a young woman, pregnant and feeling every bump on the road, every vertebra of the laden donkey, and arriving to their destination late in the purple night, lit by one bright star and so many cold shoulders. No, they said, no room here. No, they said, no room here. Not good news for someone so near. And what about the backache and the contractions near to giving birth? 
And, that, and sometimes that moment is exalted as the advent arrival of the liberator. But the truth is that dullness of heart, flatness of courage is the same as the no. The same as cold shoulders, rolling eyes, and doors blithely thrown shut. No angel, no astrologer, no star, and no sheep can convince a heart closed to the natural yes of people around us, neighbor, kin, and about to be friend. What can we liberate if we cannot see the journey as an example of our own? Throw open the door. Make ready the space. Love as though there is no other medica medication. What if you are not a righteous innkeeper, but instead the manger, the stable, the haven of rest? <laughs> Little Mouse Who Saved Christmas by Jamie Hinson Rieger, illustrated by Claudia Brooks. Once upon a time, there was a little mouse who lived in the hollow of a loose cobblestone at the bottom of a fireplace in a small but friendly Unitarian Universalist church in a small, friendly town in the Midwest. Now every year in this little UU church, they had a Christmas Eve service. And every year after the service, the church had a time for coffee and cookies. And every year after the coffee and cookies, after the church people had said their goodbyes and gone off singing into the frosty winter air, back to their beds to wait for Santa to arrive on Christmas morning. Well, every year, the sexton of that church would gather up the leftover Christmas cookies, of which there were always several dozen, and he would put them on a plate and put them on the floor beside the fireplace. And then he too would go home. The sextons at the church had been doing this for so long, they'd forgotten why they did it. It was just a tradition. The mouse loved this tradition. She enjoyed listening to the friendly people chat and laugh with each other after the service. And she especially enjoyed the plate of cookies. She would nibble on a delicious warm Christmas cookie until she had had her fill. But the most magical part came at midnight every year. When Santa's sleigh would fly high up above over the chimney 
and the plate of cookies would lift off the ground and fly up the chimney, up, 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 into the air, and on to Santa's sleigh, as if by magic. Which it was. A lot of people don't know this, but leaving cookies and other treats for Santa isn't just a nice thing to do, it's essential. It takes a lot of calories to power Santa's sleigh as he and his elves and reindeer deliver presents all over the world. And the little UU church in this little Midwestern town without knowing it had become over the years a very important refueling stop on Santa's route over the Midwest, where homes were spread much farther apart and cookies harder to come by. But this year was different. The little mouse was still lying warm in her hollow in the fireplace, but there were no people laughing and chatting inside the church, because they were all having church on Zoom this year. There was no coffee and cookies and consequently no plate put in the chimney for Santa. The sexton was safe at home, watching the church service in his bed, in his pajamas. The mouse missed the people. She definitely missed the cookies. It was a hard winter for a church mouse in a church with no people. There was scarcely any food, and after a hard week of scavenging, the little church mouse had managed to find just one small crumb of cookie, which she had decided to save for herself, to eat at midnight while Santa's sleigh flew high overhead. <gasps> Santa's sleigh! The mouse realized with a start that if there were no cookies for her, that meant there were no cookies for Santa's sleigh. She looked at the clock on the church wall. It was 11.55 p.m. on Christmas Eve. Meanwhile, from high up above in the air, the little elf riding in the front of the sleigh beside Santa frowned and tapped on the indicator light of the sleigh dashboard. He picked up the radio and called the North Pole. Elf Command, this is Sleigh Dog One, he said. I'm getting no reading on cookies at the UU Church here. I repeat, Sleigh Radar is showing no cookies at the UU Church. Can you please confirm cookies, Elf Command? From the North Pole, Elf Command said, Hang on, Sleigh Dog One. We're checking ground radar for cookies. The Elf waited. Then Elf Command came back on the radio. Sleigh Dog One. Ground radar shows no cookies at the UU Church. Repeat, no cookies at the UU Church. Uh, Elf Command, that's a problem, said the elf beside Santa in the sleigh. Our indicators show we're running seriously low on cookie fuel here. It's been a rough night for cookies this year. From the North Pole, Elf Command said, Sleigh Dog One, suggest alternate cookie sites. Is there a Starbucks nearby? The elf in the sleigh sounded a little panicked now. Negative, Elf Command. There are no Starbucks open at midnight on Christmas Eve. We're coming over the church running really low here now. The word came back from the North Pole. Sleigh Dog One, you need to call it a night and come on home. Negative, said Santa, shaking his head. On the dashboard, the cookie indicator light began to blink red. The sleigh lurched and dropped a little lower in the sky. Inside the little UU church, the mouse was racing through the kitchen. Once upon a time, there was a pantry full of boxes and snacks. Perhaps something had been left behind. She squeezed in under the pantry door. But the pantry had been emptied, the boxes of snacks taken home. She squeezed into cabinets, empty. The church was truly bare of cookie, not even a crumb. Except, she realized, for the one crumb she had saved for herself. The little mouse raced from the kitchen back to her cobblestone hollow in the fireplace, and without a second thought, she picked up her one crumb of cookie and placed it in the center of the fireplace. She didn't even have a plate. Would this work? Suddenly, she felt herself being lifted up, 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 as she and the crumb were levitated through the air, all the way up to Santa's sleigh, as if by magic. Which it was. The sleigh was shaking and beginning to dip down lower and lower. The cookie indicator light was blinking an angry red. 
The little mouse nudged the cookie crumb toward Santa with her tiny paw. Santa picked up the crumb with the tip of his finger and placed it in a little hollow in the dashboard. All at once, the sleigh shot back up high in the air, and the cookie indicator light turned from red to green. The elf gave a sigh of relief, <sighs> and Santa laughed his jolly ho, 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 his belly shaking like, well, you know. The mouse was relieved too. But how, she wondered, how could such a tiny crumb power Santa's sleigh when it took a whole giant plate of cookies before. Santa responded to the mouse as if he could read her mind, which of course he could. My sleigh doesn't really run on cookies, little mouse, he said. It runs on kindness and you giving away your one crumb so everyone else could have Christmas was the kindest act we've seen in many years. We'll easily have power enough now to get through the rest of the night, thanks to you. The little mouse spent the rest of the night beside Santa and the elves, happy to be with people again as they made their way through the night and across the country, spreading Christmas cheer all along the way. The End
bells in the air Beauty everywhere You're tied by the fireside And joyful memories there Christmas time is here We'll be drawing near Oh, that we could always see Such spirit through the year Oh, that we could always see That we could always see such spirit through the And the Christmas story. There's so many different iterations of the Christmas story, and there's been so many times that it has been told. And this, this evening, I would like to read for you Barbara Robinson's book, um, a piece of her book, uh, The Best. Well, first it says worst, and the worst is crossed out, and then it says best. The best Christmas pageant ever. And I'd like to read the last chapter of that book for you. I'll just pull it up. I'm going to be reading it on my Kindle, so I'll have to change the pages and things like that, um, and hopefully not play around with it too much. Um, I hope you enjoy this um, humorous and slightly irreverent um, take on the Christmas, uh, the Christmas story. And it's regarding a pageant, a church pageant. And, and there's a family that is be referred to in the pageant, the, uh, the Herdmans. And um, you have to read the whole story to understand uh, about the Herdmans. But um, there was some fear having them take part in the play. On the night of the pageant, we didn't have any supper because mother forgot to fix it. My father said that it was all right. Between Mrs. Armstrong's telephone calls and the pageant rehearsals, he didn't expect anything else. He didn't expect supper anymore. When it's all over, he said, well, go someplace and have hamburgers. But mother said, when it's all over, she might want to go someplace and hide. We've never once gone through the whole thing, she said. I don't know what's going to happen. It may be the first Christmas pageant in history where Joseph and the wise men get in a fight and Mary runs away with the baby. She might be right, I thought, and I wondered what all of us in the angel choir ought to do in case that happened. It would be dumb for us just to stand there singing about the holy infant if Mary had run off with them. But nothing seemed very different at first. There was the usual big mess all over the place. Baby angels getting poked in the eye by other baby angels' wings. And grumpy shepherds stumbling over their bathrobes. The spotlight swooped back and forth and up and down till it made you sick at your stomach to look at it. And, as usual, whoever was playing the piano pitched away in a manger so high we could hardly hear it, let alone sing it. My father says away in a manger always starts out sounding like a closet full of mice. But everything settled down, and at 7.30, the pageant began. While we sang Away in a Manger, the ushers lit candles all around the church, and the spotlight came on to be the star. 
So you really had to know the words to Away in a Manger because you couldn't see anything. Not even Alice Wendelkin's Vaseline eyelids. And in the other part of the story, um, Alice's mother put Vaseline on her eyelids so that her daughter would uh, show up kind of shiny during the pageant. After that, we sang two verses of O Little Town of Bethlehem. And then we were supposed to hum more of O Little Town of Bethlehem while Mary and Joseph came in from a side door. Only they didn't come right away. So we hummed and hummed and hummed, which is boring and also very hard. And before long, it doesn't sound like any song at all. More like an old refrigerator. I knew something like this would happen, Alice Wendelkin whispered to me. They didn't come at all. We won't have any Mary and Joseph. And now what are we supposed to do? I guess we could have gone on humming till we all turned blue, but we didn't have to. Ralph and Imogene were there all right, only for once they didn't come through the door pushing each other out of the way. They just stood there for a minute as if they weren't sure they were in the right place. Because of the candles, I guess, and the church being full of people, they looked like the people you see on the 6 o'clock news, refugees, sent to wait in some strange, ugly place, with all their boxes and sacks around them. It suddenly occurred to me that this was just the way it must have been for the real Holy Family, stuck away in a barn by people who didn't much care what happened to them. They couldn't have been very neat and tidy either. But more like this, Mary and Joseph. Imogene's veil was cockeyed as usual, and Ralph's hair stuck out all around his ears. Imogene had the baby doll, but she wasn't carrying it the way she was supposed to, cradled in her arms. She had it slung up over her shoulder, and before she put it in the manger, she, in the manger, she, sh she thumped it twice on the back. I heard Alice gasp, and she poked me. I don't think it's very nice to burp the baby Jesus she whispered, as if he had colic. And then she poked me again. Do you think he might have had colic? I said, I don't know why not. And I didn't. He could have had colic or been fussy or hungry like any other baby. After all, that was the whole point of Jesus, that he didn't come down on a cloud like something out of amazing comics but that he was born and lived, a real person. Right away, we had to sing while shepherds watched their flocks by night, and we had to sing very loud because there were more shepherds than there were anything else, and they made so much noise banging their crooks around like a lot, lot of hockey sticks. Next came Gladys from behind the angel choir, pushing people out of the way and stepping on everyone's feet. Since Gladys was the only one in the pageant who had anything to say, she made the most of it. Hey, unto you a child is born, she hollered, as if it was, for sure, the best news in the world. And all the shepherds trembled, sore afraid of Gladys, mainly, but it looked good anyway. Then came three carols about angels. It took that long to get the angels in because they were, all, they were all primary kids. And they got nervous and cried and forgot where they were supposed to go and bent their wings in the door. 
and things like that. We got a little rest then while the boys sang We Three Kings of Orient Are and everybody in the audience shifted around to watch the wise men march up the aisle. What have they got? asked Whis Alice Whispert. I don't know, but whatever it was, it was heavy. Leroy almost dropped it. He didn't have his frankincense jar either, and Claude and Oli, Ollie didn't have anything, although they were supposed to bring the gold and myrrh. I knew this would happen, Alice said for the second time. I bet it's something awful. Like what? Like a burnt offering. You know the herdmans. Well, they did burn things, but they hadn't burned this yet. It was a ham. And right away, I knew where it came from. My father was on the Charitable Works Committee. They give away food baskets at Christmas. And this was the Herdman's Christmas, this was the Herdman's food basket ham. It still had the ribbon around it saying, Merry Christmas. I bet they stole that, Alice said. They did not. It came from their food basket. And if they want to give it away their own and if they want to give away their own ham, I guess they can do it. But even if the herdmans didn't like ham, that was Alice's next idea. They had never before in their lives given anything away except lumps on the head. So you had to be impressed. Leroy dropped the ham in front of the manger. It looked funny there, sitting there, instead of the fancy bath salts jars we always used for the myrrh and frankincense. And then they went and sat down in the only space that was left. While we sang, What Child Is This?, the wise men were supposed to confer among themselves and then leave by a different door so everyone would understand that they were going home another way. But the herdmans forgot, or didn't want to, or something, because they didn't confer, and they didn't leave either. They just sat there, and there wasn't anything anyone could do about it. They're ruining the whole thing, Alice whispered but they weren't at all. As a, as a matter of fact, it made perfect sense for the wise men to sit down and rest. And I said so. They're supposed to have come from a long way. You, you wouldn't expect them just to show up, hand over the ham, and leave. As for ruining the whole thing, it seemed to me that the herdmans had, had improved the pageant a lot just by doing what came naturally, like burping the baby, for instance, or thinking a ham would make a better present than a lot of perfumed oil. Usually by the time we got to Silent Night, which was always the last carol, I was fed up with the whole thing and couldn't wait for it to be over. But I, I didn't feel that way this time. I almost wished for the pageant to go on, with the herdmans in charge, to see what else they would do that was different. Maybe the wise men would tell Mary about their problem with Herod, and she would tell them to go back and lie their heads off. Or Joseph might go with them and get rid of Herod once and for all. Or maybe, or Joseph and Mary might ask the wise men to take the Christ child with them, figuring that no one would look, think to look there. I was so busy making plans to save new, new ways to save the baby Jesus that I missed the beginning of Silent Night. Because it was, but it was all right, because everyone sang Silent Night, including the audience. We sang all the verses 
and when we got to Son of God, Love's Pure Light, I happened to look at Emma Jean and I almost dropped my hymn book on a baby angel. Everyone had been waiting all this time for the Herdmans to do something absolutely unexpected. And sure enough, that's what happened. Imogene Herdman was crying. In the candlelight, her face was all shiny with tears, and she didn't even bother to wipe them away. She just sat there, awful old Imogene, in her crookedy veil, crying and crying and crying. Well, it was the best Christmas pageant we ever had. Everybody said so, but nobody seemed to know why. When it was over, people stood around the lobby of the church talking about what was different this year. There was something special, everybody said. They couldn't put their finger on what, though. Mrs. Wendelkin said, Well, Mary, the mother of Jesus, had a black eye. That was something special. But only what you might expect, she added. She meant that it was the most natural thing in the world for a herdman to have a black eye. But actually nobody hit Imogene, and she didn't hit anyone else. Her eye wasn't really black either, just all puffy and swollen. She had walked into the corner of the choir robe cabinet in a kind of daze, as if she had just caught on to the idea of God and the wonder of Christmas. And this was the funny thing about it. For years, I thought about the wonder of Christmas and the mystery of Jesus' birth and never really understood it. But now, because of the Herdmans, it didn't seem so mysterious after all. When Imogene had asked me what the pageant was about, I told her it was about Jesus. But that was just part of it. It was about a new baby and the baby's mother and father who were in a lot of trouble. No money, no place to go, no doctor, nobody they knew. And then, arriving from the east, like my uncle from New Jersey, some rich friends. But Imogene, I guess, didn't see it that way. Christmas just came over her all at once, like a case of chills and the fever. And so she was crying and walking into furniture. Afterward, there were candy canes and little tiny testaments for everyone, and a poinsettia plant for my mother from the whole Sunday school. We put the costumes away and folded up the collapsible manger. And just before my le my, and just before we left, my father snuffed out the last of the tall white candles. I guess that's everything he said as we stood at the back of the church. All over now, it was quite a pageant. Then he looked at my mother. What's that you got? It's the ham, she said. They wouldn't take it back. They wouldn't take any candy either or any of the little Bibles. But Imogene did ask me for a set of the Bible story pictures. And she took out the Mary picture and said it was ex exactly right, whatever that means. I think it meant that no matter how she herself was, Imogene liked the idea of the Mary in the picture, all pink and white and pure looking as if she never washed the dishes or cooked supper or did anything at all except have Jesus on Christmas Eve. But as far as I'm concerned, Mary is always going to look a lot like Imogene Herdman, sort of nervous and bewildered but ready to clobber anyone who laid a hand on her baby. And the wise men were always going to be Leroy and his brothers, bearing ham. 
When we came out of the church that night, it was cold and clear with crunchy snow underfoot and bright, bright stars overhead. And I thought about the angel of the Lord, Gladys, with her skinny legs and her dirty sneakers sticking out from under her robe, yelling at all of us everywhere. Hey, unto you a child is born. The end. All is calm, all is bright On this snowy, silent night And the angels sing Every night a child is born Is a holy night All is peaceful, bathed in light On this dark and the angels sing every night a child is born is a holy night all is joy pure delight on this chilly winter night and the angels sing every night a child is born is a holy night whether two thousand years ago with this morning's breaking That brings us to the end of our Christmas Eve service. May the warmth you feel, may the gifts you bring, and may the love you feel feed you until we can be together again. At the end of Silent Night, I invite you to extinguish your candle or chalice. Go in pe peace, gentle people, go in peace. And I'd like to wish you all a happy Christmas, a season's greetings, um, happy Kwanzaa, whatever, whatever is meaningful to you at this time of year. May the return of the light dwell in your hearts and minds, and may you be blessed. Good night.